G'day mate, 40 here. How did you never hear that President Xi is particularly smart or adept? Right? Never hear about how brilliant he is, what a good strategist he is. He just seems like a thug. So his big uh, Time Magazine cover story, the world's future is in the hands of President Xi. Well, personality doesn't actually matter that much. The world's future is in the hands of Chinese President Xi Jinping. Nah, the world's future is not in the hands of Xi Jinping. <laughs> personality doesn't matter that much. It doesn't matter that much whether Donald Trump is president or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is president. Maybe we're talking 15% difference. It's not irrelevant, right? Maybe it's a 20% difference. We're looking out here from Watson's Bay over to Manly, right? So no Hitler, no Holocaust, for example, right? That's, that's some difference, right? So six million Jews would have likely survived World War II, not for Adolf Hitler, but Germany would have still launched two world wars in the first half of the 20th century. No matter who was the leader of Germany, it was in their strategic interest to make a go at seizing control of Europe and f fight you know, fast, quick wars. Germany had the potential to win fast, quick wars. But uh, personality doesn't matter as much as structure. China's president is on the cusp of a third term. Never before has the globe been so dependent on one man's whims. No, we're not really dependent upon one man's whims. Right? He can he can affect China, he can affect the world, so unless he launches a nuclear war, right, which I don't believe he's gonna do, the world's not dependent on his whims. So he can follow more or less effective policies. He can be smarter or dumber about his trade or foreign or economic policy. But uh, the world is not run by the whims of President Xi. But the world is run by structure. I see the water pounding against the rocks. Those are structural forces. The world is run by the power of economies and militaries. The structure of economies, the structure of militaries, the geography of nation states, the demographics of nation states. That's what runs the world. It's not uh, Xi's or Putin's whims. Written by Charlie Campbell. So even if Putin hadn't been in charge of the Soviet Union, Right, or even if he leaves office, the right, Soviet Union is still going to have a strong incentive to do things like invade Ukraine. Right? The structural reasons created by NATO you know, incentivized whoever leads Russia to you know, send, send a warning and to try to build up protections for the country against invasion, right, to try to secure their country, right? Number one task for any nation state is to survive. And the best way to survive is to be as strong as possible. Time, narrated by Emily Wu Zeller. Back in March 2018, I found my mind wandering inside Beijing's Great Hall of the People as China's rubber stamp parliament voted to remove the two-term presidential limit. Ensconced in the building's top tier with other journalists and dignitaries straining to hear the proceedings, I stared up at the huge red star ceiling motif that loomed over Chinese Communist Party, CCP delegates. So journalism loves to focus on personalities because personalities are particularly compelling. Right? But journalism has not peer-reviewed academic literature, bruh. Right? It's, uh, it can be compelling, but... It's not scholarly, 
it's not even necessarily important, it's attention grabbing. Right? So Time Magazine, Sydney Morning Herald, the New York Times have to grab your attention. So in the course of grabbing your attention, you often say stupid things. Nearby, two bored European diplomats gossiped noisily. If we perhaps failed to grasp the magnitude of what was transpiring in that auditorium four and a half years ago, it's only too clear today. The world has since endured a pandemic that sprouted amid official obfuscation in China's central city of Wuhan. So if China had a different leader, right, it, it's doubtful that its response to COVID would have been substantially different. And China's an autocratic dictatorial state. Uh, Brezhnev, remember, he was the supreme leader of the Soviet Union. And when he backed down against John F. Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was removed from power. So even dictators don't necessarily have absolute power. And spilled across every continent to claim an estimated 15 million lives. Beijing has led a campaign of incarceration and indoctrination of its Uyghur Muslim minority that the UN on August 31st decreed. Okay, that has nothing to do with how strong China is or how much it threatens the United States, right? These internal factors, the personality of leaders, the structure of an internal political system doesn't really have that much of an effect on international power relations. International power relations are driven by power, economic and military, and by the geography and demographics behind nation states. Crimes against humanity. And okay, so if a regime employs crimes against humanity, it's not going to make it more or less formidable. Right? Democracies are probably even more likely to be brutal in the way they wage war, because they will tend to picture wars, right? Democracies picture wars that they engage in as good versus evil. China has backed Russia's February 24th invasion of Ukraine. When you picture a war like the war over Ukraine as good versus evil, it comes with the downside of much harder to compromise, and it's harder to compromise, there's likely to be much more suffering. So I've walked from Kuji to Watson's Bay here, and yeah, I'm a little, uh, little tuckered out. Parroting Vladimir Putin's excuses regarding NATO expansion, refusing to join international sanctions, and amplifying Kremlin propaganda. Oh no. The architect of all this tumult was the man in the blue tie sitting below me, who that spring afternoon was effectively anointed China's leader for life, President Xi Jinping. On October 16th, Xi's coronation as emperor will be complete. The 20th CCP Congress, to be held at that same squad building, will mark the start of his third leadership term. Ripping up a long-held convention that Chinese leaders serve only two. It effectively ends the institutionalization of political power around the party that Shepard... Ah, so it's no longer institutional because he's taken an extra turn? Not necessarily. Right? No man is invulnerable. He still depends upon people to follow his orders. Uh, you can't, can't match, get much done in life if you can't get cooperation, even when you're a dictator. Like, read stories in the Bible. Kings with supposedly absolute power still depended upon their lieutenants and their populations and cooperation. The mood of a country, circumstances, the culture. A lot of variables in life. So who's the boss? Is it President Xi? No, it's the situation's the boss. China's economic miracle and instead centers it on a single individual swathed in a cult of personality not seen since Mao Zedong. Okay, that's just packaging. That doesn't make China more or less formidable. Doesn't make China more or less dangerous as a rival, great power rival to the United States. At the age of 69, she becomes China's most powerful leader in modern history. But it's an apotheosis that threatens unprecedented instability. What threatens instability is the structure of international 
inflations is the tragedy of great power politics. Right? Instability is written into the nature of our life on this planet. We are all stuck in an iron cage together. And the stronger one party gets, the more incentives the other parties have for ganging up against it, which is happening now with China, Japan, India, Australia, Korea, increasingly ganging up against China. So you can see the Sydney Harbour Bridge out there on the horizon, and to the left of it will be the Sydney Opera House, which you can't see from here. That's the central business district of Sydney.